The, the class tonight is on uh, Holy Orders chapter, or the ordained ministry on, on cha or chapter 14 of your In His Light book. And I'm going to go over a number of things. If you have a question, feel free to um, raise your hand and, and ask me. But the most important day in my religious life is the day that I do not remember, a day I did not ask for, and a day that my parents did not take any pictures of, as far as I know. It was the day that I was baptized uh, as an infant, probably, uh, you know, within the first uh, three or four months of my life. And baptism really is the very essential uh, uh, sacrament of salvation that shows forth that God chooses us, calls us, incorporates us into his body, which is the church, and it is there that we come to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ in this life in order to be happy with him forever in the life to come, which he has gained for us through his incarnation, his life, his public ministry, his uh, baptism, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his giving of the Holy Spirit, and his promise of returning at the end of time and his second coming. But God chose me, he loved me, and I became a part of God's priestly people called to worship God the Father in and with and through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. In this way, we share in the church's highest form of worship. And among the priestly people of God, all of us who are baptized, um, God chooses men to share in the ministerial priesthood or the ordained ministry. And in the sacrament of holy orders, there are three groupings, and we'll talk about each of those uh, as I go progress tonight. Uh, the highest um, grouping, or the, the fullness of sharing in the priesthood of Christ, is that of bishops. Secondly, priests who are ordained by bishops to assist bishops in their ministry. And then deacons who are ordained by bishops to assist bishops and priests in the ministry of the word of God and caring for the needs uh, of the poor, among other things. And uh, we'll talk about that specifically. But the ordained ministry of the Catholic Church is a special call from God. And some of you may know or may not know, I was the vocation director for our diocese from 1986 until 1998 which meant I had the responsibility of recruiting candidates for the priesthood in, for the Diocese of Savannah, uh, of screening them when they applied, following up with them once we accepted them in the seminary, and then working with the bishop to, to make sure that uh, they were properly uh, formed in the seminary, that the seminary gave good recommendations and evaluations of them, and that the bishop then should call them uh, to ordination. But in terms of the call to the priesthood, Two things must be necessary or present. That the individual himself has to have a desire to want to become a priest. Uh, and there are different levels of desire, obviously. Uh, some people think that they want to, but then they think about what they have to give up, and then they're not sure, and, but yet they want to. And so there's a lot of discernment that has to go on. Uh, but that desire is necessary because it's prompted by the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I would say the same thing is true of someone who even at a very young age knows that they want to be a doctor. Something mysterious is going on in that person that is moving them into the direction of becoming a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist or a teacher or whatever avocation that they choose in life or to be married. Uh, and the same thing is true with wanting to become a priest. There's something mysterious that's going on in the psyche, the soul, uh, the mind of the one who feels that they're being called. But the second necessary component of the call to the priesthood is the call of the bishop to the candidate to become a priest. And the bishop has to rely upon what the church teaches in terms of who can be called and who can't be called, and the doctrines and canon law that surround that phenomenon. 
So, for example, I could want to be a, become a priest, uh, and I'm certain that I'm being called, and I go and knock on the vocation director's door and say, I want to become a priest. The uh, vocation director gives me an application form. I go through a battery of tests uh, in terms of the screening process, and then finally the vocation director says, I don't think you have a call to the priesthood. And uh, because of a number of issues that might be present, and the person that says that they have a call will be upset with me or upset with the bishop if, if the bishop says, well, I'm not going to call you to be ordained because of this, this, and this. And, and the person will say, well, I'm being called by God. How can you say I'm not being called? The bishop says, well, yes, but God is acting through me and you are not being called uh, to be a priest. Okay? Um, so that's one component. The second component, which I just mentioned, is the call of the bishop. But if the person does not have a desire, the bishop or the vocation director can call them till they're blue in the face. The person doesn't have a vocation. They're not going to apply. They're not going to follow through. And if they get in the seminary, they're going to drop out. Or if they become ordained uh, and feel like they really were talked into this, th they probably will leave the priesthood. So, so both components have to be present, a strong desire and the call of the church. And if either one of those is absent, then there is, in fact, no call. So the ordained ministry is a special call to the service of the Word of God through writing, preaching, teaching, and living the faith. We are called to reflect in God's Word. Uh, in terms of my own call to the priesthood, I would say that the greatest hindrance for me personally, apart from the uh, frightening aspect of submitting myself to a myself to a higher authority uh, in terms of seminary evaluating me and the priest, uh, the bishop evaluating me and all that, was this fear of preaching and teaching and writing and celebrating mass in public. Uh, all of that was uh, um, very frightening to me in my early 20s when I felt like I was being called. And then on top of that, uh, I just, just felt like I was a human being, a sinner, and not worthy of the calling. And, and so there are things that can keep people away, and sometimes formation in the seminary uh, helps you to overcome those things. And in, in, in my case, I think that it did, some 30 years later. So the ordained ministry is a special call to the service and worship of the celebration of the sacraments of the church, as well as proclaiming the Word of God. And within the context of the church's liturgy and sacraments, we worship God, and uh, we invite the community to worship God as well. The ordained ministry is a special call of service of leadership. Um, for example, when you look at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in terms of the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper, give specific accounts of how Jesus sat down at table with his apostles, took bread, broke it, said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. And the same thing is true with the, the, the wine. He said, take this, all of you, drink from it. This is my blood poured out for you. John's gospel does not proclaim that, if you read John's gospel. It presumes that, and it presumes that the people that are reading his gospel know about that, and certainly they should have. But what he focuses on in the context of, the, of Holy Thursday night, the night before Jesus dies, well, can anybody tell me what does St. John's Gospel focus on? Instead of enunciating what actually happened at the table of the Last Supper, what does he focus in on? I'm sorry? Well, no, well that's later on, but uh, I'm talking about the, the actual occurrence of what Jesus did on Holy Thursday night. Say it again? The washing of the feet. Now, was that a Catholic that said that or a catechumen? <laughs> Some of the times our Catholics answer my questions for the catechumens. Okay. But anyway, the washing of the feet. Okay. Uh, so, before the Lord's Supper, the Lord bends down and washes the feet of the, the disciples. Now, what Jesus does on Holy Thursday night is to establish two interrelated sacraments. First of all, uh, he institutes the Most Holy Eucharist, the Mass, by doing what he did at the Last Supper with the bread and the wine. 
as the memorial of what will occur to him on Good Friday and the way in which the church will recall that and celebrate that until the Lord returns at the end of time. But secondly, he ordained the 12 apostles to celebrate the Eucharist after Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, ascension into heaven, and giving of the Holy Spirit. So that's very critical that the 12 apostles were ordained at the Lord's Supper. Now, they become the first priest of the church, if you will. But the uh, 12 apostles were of what religion? Jewish. They were Jewish. The Jewish people did have a cultic priesthood, which we'll talk about in a second. But it was primarily concerned with the worship of God, and you had to be born into a priestly caste or, or family. Okay? But all they did was to offer sacrifice in the temple until the temple was destroyed. Um, but they didn't do anything else. They kind of were above the people. They didn't really teach either. They weren't like rabbis. They just offered the sacrifice, uh, the sacrifices that were offered in the temple. That is not the type of priesthood that Jesus institutes on Holy Thursday, and he makes that clear by washing the feet of the disciples, that they are not only to offer the sacrifice of the Mass uh, after Jesus gives the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but they are also to serve the needs of the people of the church, especially those most in need. And Jesus gives them a, a, a role model for that. They are to get their hands dirty by doing an impure act for, in the Jewish mind of a priest washing dirty feet. Okay? Now you have to keep in mind, Jesus Christ is the high priest. And so he's giving uh, an example to the apostles that are being ordained to share in the high priesthood of Jesus, but the apostles themselves are not the high priest. Jesus is, and he continues to be in every Mass that is celebrated. Whoever is celebrating a Mass, whether it's a bishop or a priest, only shares in the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is the exclusive high priest that offers himself to his Heavenly Father uh, again and again uh, at every Mass that we celebrate. So, but the, the priesthood of the Christian order is not just cultic or worship-oriented. It also means meeting people where they are, preaching the word, washing feet, waiting on tables, all of the other things that you associate with uh, ministry in the church. Um, so that's why John's Gospel emphasizes that aspect, whereas the other uh, three Gospels really don't go into that much of uh, a detail. And then one of the things that is important too for us uh, as Catholics who share also in the priesthood of Jesus Christ by virtue of baptism, but not to the same degree as bishops, priests, and deacons, and they do not, serve, they do not share in the same degree as Christ, the high priest. We only share in that. And the laity share in that to a, a certain degree as well. All of us, men and women, who comprise the laity. And even ordained priests are configured to the laity, even, even as they are configured to Christ when they offer the sacrifice of the Mass or any of the sacraments. Uh, we're not independent of the people. In fact, we, relate, we, we um, represent the people as well as we represent Christ at the altar. Uh, we represent the people's worship and sacrifice but the priest also represents Christ, who is the high priest. So, um, so one of the most important parts of the Mass is when the deacon or the priest says, the Mass is in to go in peace, and we say thanks be to God. But we're not saying thanks be to God because the Mass is over with and we can go home. Uh, we're saying thanks be to God so we can be followers of Christ. We will be a priestly people in the world in which we live, at home, at work, at play. And that the laity's primary role is in the world, in politics, and how you live your Christian family life, in your marriage, uh, how you deal with your employers, or how you are as an employee. Uh, your Catholic faith has to be lived in that context, and we have to bring the principles of Jesus Christ to every aspect of our secular life, and make that holy, and to make our lives holy. Priests and bishops, and to a certain extent deacons, 
don't live in the world. We're not elected to high, uh, well, we do live in the world. <laughs> I don't live on Mars. Uh, but we don't, we don't have the same secular jobs that you have uh, normally. And we don't get elected to office. And, and normally, in the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, priests and bishops are not married. So our, our um, uh, calling is of a different degree than your calling. But we're all in it together, so to speak. And, and so it really distresses me when I see Catholics who are politicians, either on the local or national level, who discount the church's teaching on pro-life or other moral issues in order to represent the people that they're trying to get elected from, or the people that will elect them. Uh, and I'm saying you're a Catholic and you represent the Catholic Church first, and in doing so you are representing God. And that's what the Second Vatican Council called the laity to do. And they seem, some that are in public office now seem to be missing that altogether. And that really is sad because it's not the teaching of the Catholic Church. So, in the Western Rite of the Catholic Church, which we, is also called the Latin Rite, Catholic priests are also called to celibacy, and bishops are called to celibacy. For most of us who are priests, it must be also a call and a gift, and not all are called. So not everyone is called to, to, to be a celibate person. Not everyone is called to be married. You have to discern what you feel your calling is and what your gifts are and what the energy that God has given you in one area or another. So in the Catholic Church, not only does the person have to have a uh, a feeling of being called by God to serve the church as a priest, and the bishop has to discern that with them as well, but they also have to be called to celibacy. Now celibacy means imitating Jesus Christ, who was not married, okay? And he wasn't married because he didn't have time to get married. He could have gotten married if he wanted to, uh, I presume. But he wanted to make sure that the world knew, as well as the church, that his bride was the body of Christ. And he did not have another bride to be concerned about that he would be exclusive with. Who he would be exclusive with are all the baptized people of God, which is concern, considered uh, the bride of Christ. And so in a sense, the Catholic priest who is celibate symbolizes or is a sign of the um, single-mindedness of the Lord towards his proper bride, which is the church. In a sense, that would be true of any Catholic priest and certainly of any uh, Catholic bishop. It is a special witness and a gift, and as such, um, uh, can be a very powerful sign. Now, in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, which is in union with the, the Pope, married men are allowed to be ordained priests, but married men cannot become bishops. Okay. Only celibate priests can become bishops in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church. And in Orthodoxy as well, the Greek Orthodox, uh, whatever Orthodox branch there is, they're usually nationalistic. They do allow married men to become priests. But even in the Orthodox Church, they have never allowed priests who are celibate, celibate to marry. You see the difference there? So if you're going to become a priest in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church or in the Orthodox Church, you have to go out and get married first. And I think the custom, quite frankly, is that uh, you can be married and in the seminary and then be ordained uh, uh, a married priest, or at a certain point in your seminary training, you can indicate that you want to go out and find a wife. You leave the seminary, go out and find a wife, then you come back and conclude your seminary training and you are ordained. But there are many others in the Orthodox Church as well as in the Eastern Rite of the Church who feel called to celibacy and they uh, uh, commit to a celibate lifestyle, make a promise of that uh, uh, um, um, at their ordination. But only bishops, since they are the highest order of the sacrament of holy orders, only bishops in the Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church are celibate, uh, and they're only chosen from the celibate uh, clergy because of this uh, uniqueness that I speak of in terms of being an image of Christ and uh, the exclusivity that Christ has towards his bride, the church. So even in orthodoxy, that is uh, preeminent amongst uh, the bishops of the church. So the question is, in our Latin rite, 
which is the Catholic Church that most of us experience throughout the United States, is it possible that the Pope could permit priests to get married? No. Deacon Pat is saying yes, but no. He <laughs> won't. He cannot allow priests to get married. Okay. <laughs> Once a priest, you are not allowed to get married. But if you are a single Catholic who is married and would like to become a priest, that is possible. No, you wouldn't be single and married. If you are a married Catholic who would like to become a priest, that could be possible. The Pope could change the discipline of the church in that regard, and he has. Uh, for certain special occasions, not occasions, but sp certain special groups. And one of the groups that he has relaxed that on in the United States of, the, of America and now throughout the world are Episcopal or Anglican priests who are already married. But they, if they are disaffected with their Episcopal church or Anglican church and have what they feel is a calling to the Catholic church, on an individual basis, they would be examined, their married life looked at, and then they would be allowed to complete seminary training, if you will, in the Catholic faith, and then they could be ordained priests. Okay? Now, something very, and, we, and in Augusta, when I was in Augusta, I was at Most Holy Trinity in Augusta downtown, my associate pastor for the whole 14 years that I was there was a married priest. Okay? But he had been a, a former Episcopal priest. His wife, participated in the life of our parish. He was a lector. He had seven uh, grown, seven was it? Seven grown children. Uh, all of them married. He had grandchildren. And he functioned just as I did. He heard confessions just as I do. He's, he's dead now. Uh, but uh, died, what, two years ago, three years ago, something like that. Um, but he had been an Episcopal priest to begin with. Um, the only awkward time that I ever experienced in the parish was not from my parishioners, they all accepted him and loved him, and, and Most Holy Trinity was a very traditional <laughs> parish, it is a very traditional parish, they didn't bat an eye. But occasionally he would preach on Sunday about his wife and children, <laughs> and name them by name, his wife, and, uh, and I'd be greeting people after Mass, and we'd have visitors from other places, and they'd come up to me and say, is this a Catholic church? <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, why are you asking? <laughs> well, he was talking about his wife, the priest in there. I said, oh, yes, we are a Catholic church. And then I had to go into this whole explanation that I just gave you. But in addition to this privilege, it's called the uh, pastoral provision, Pope Benedict XVI has taken it one step further and more radical than what Pope John Paul II did in terms of allowing certain Episcopal clergy to come in to the Catholic Church. What Pope Benedict has done, and this is more directed to the Anglican Church, which is the Episcopal Church, in England, England itself, but it would also impact us in the United States, is that he is setting up a separate group within the Catholic Church for former members of the Episcopal Church, including their clergy and their bishops, to come into the Catholic Church, but maintain many of their legitimate traditional customs in terms of how they pray, uh, in terms of their spirituality, in terms of their music, in terms of even the way in which they would celebrate the Eucharist. Okay? Except uh, the Catholic Church has to make sure that if we, bar if we use the traditional Episcopal form for celebrating the Eucharist, certain things have to be added for it to be valid. And then the priest of the Episcopal Church would be reordained, even if they're married, and could celebrate the Mass, but as an Episcopalian would, except for these minor changes that I'm describing. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. A little bit. Uh, actually, uh, Pope John Paul did this to a limited degree back in the 80s, and, and I think it was when the uh, Anglican Communion uh, began ordaining women. And you had in the United States uh, several parishes and even one diocese who simply who said, we can't take it anymore, we want to come home to Rome. And, and if I can elaborate a little bit, the reason why uh, this is allowed is because the Anglican liturgy uh, essentially began as a Catholic Mass. The Anglican Mass was always uh, unique and, and somewhat 
different from the Roman Rite. And so when the Church of England split off from the Catholic Church in the 1500s, they, they took the Catholic liturgy with them and Protestantized it. So it's really a matter of just correcting the Protestant deficiencies to restore it to, to its Catholic status. Basically, that's correct. Now the other interesting thing about what Pope Benedict is allowing is that they are now becoming their own diocese. For example, if we had, let's say that every Episcopal church in Macon wanted to become Catholic, okay? How many parishes would you say there are in Macon Episcopal churches? Three or four, okay. Um, but let's say that they're very Catholic already, but they're Episcopalian, they're disaffected with their church, with a number of things that are happening in the, in the Episcopal Church, and it, it is, according to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's technically the, the, the spiritual head of the Episcopal Church, disintegrating before his very eyes. Uh, it is in total chaos, uh, and that's creating a lot of angst amongst Episcopalians. And so let's say that they wanted to uh, come into the Catholic Church, our bishop would work with them, all the members of those churches would have to go through kind of a, con a convert class preparation. Their clergy, if they're male, uh, would, would go through a process of discernment and, and being taught what the differences are between Catholicism and what they are accustomed to. And then they could be ordained, and then if there was a bishop in this area that wanted to, uh, an Episcopal bishop, he could not be ordained a bishop because he's married, but he could or be ordained a priest and given the status of what is called an apostolic administrator, where he could wear the bishop's mitre and the crozier and have authority over the three parishes here in Macon, independent of Bishop Kevin Bolin of the Diocese of Savannah. That's what's unique. And that's kind of unique in the history of the church, yes? Yeah, sort of like the military. Right. As a, as a diocese for all the military, right? Correct. But what's, what's unique about this is that the problem is there are many Episcopal bishops that want to become Catholic and remain bishops, but they can't because they're married. And in the Catholic tradition and the Orthodox tradition, you can't be married and be a bishop. But the Pope has arranged for these bishops to have bishop status without being a bishop. And that's unique. <laughs> Very unique. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I mean, you think that the Pope is becoming more lenient per se? I mean, is there is there that big of a need? Um, well, what he is concerned about Pope Benedict is Christian unity, and quite frankly, he would see unity as people being drawn into the full communion of the Catholic Church. So he is making a way for that to occur for for Episcopalians or Anglicans. Also, I mean, is that? Kind of creating like a Catholicism version 2.0 or something, or, or I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> say that again. What I have to remember that one. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, well, what has to happen with these, these Episcopalians that are coming in, they have to accept all the teachings of the Catholic Church and the authority, and the authority of the Pope. So, so whatever is lacking right now, part of their formation process before they're received into the full communion of the Church is to make sure that they embrace everything that we believe. And purify them. Yeah. You know. Right. That they can become a Catholic. Right. Right. Just because. Right. They have to go through a discernment process, and there has to be the right reason for that. Uh, and evidently, in the, in England, this is going to be a bigger phenomenon uh, than it will be in this country, uh, because the Church of England is disintegrating. I mean, literally, just falling apart. So, so the Pope is really just reaching out to these groups and and giving them an alternative to maybe joining some other uh, denomination, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, there's always been different practices without differences in theology. So there's 20-something, 20 22, I think, different rites. There's a the Maronite rite, Melchite rite, etc. <clears throat> so in one sense, it, it's not quite the same, but in one sense, they're like a different rite. <clears throat> So they'll do things a little different, but they still recognize the teachings of the church, the authority of the Pope, etc. Right. And this is a unique thing. There's actually, just to show how far it goes, there's a, there's a Middle Eastern Catholic rite, fully Roman Catholic in communion with the Pope, uh, and in their liturgy, God is referred to as Allah. So. 
Yeah. 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 But They're, it's the trying yeah. Christian God. Right. Right. If there was a question. I, I was just going to ask if, um, if an Episcopal church wanted to change. What if they had a woman? The woman could not be a priest. She would have to step down. She would have to, and she could become a Catholic, but she could not be a priest. But if it was the church that wanted to join the Catholic Church, chances are they wouldn't have chosen a woman. To Co be correct, married. correct. The, 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 the people that are more liberal in the Episcopal Church and have female clergy are not going to join us. Uh, it, it just won't happen. Although there have been some female priests yes. becoming Catholic, uh, but not as priests. So they can't be priests. Um, yes. Can someone from the Episcopal Church here take the Eucharist at our church? No, not yet. No, no, no. Uh, we don't have it in our communion with them. Now, the Orthodox, technically, if there's a Greek Orthodox Church up the road, they have uh, valid holy orders. They have the same um, orders that we have that are recognized by the Catholic Church, bishop, priest, and deacons, although they're not in union with the Pope, but their ordination is valid. We don't see the Episcopal orders valid for a number of reasons. Buck probably could explain it better. It has something to do with how they were ordained. And the Catholic Church declared them invalid. So every Episcopal priest that we bring into the Catholic Church to be a priest, they have to be reconfirmed because only a bishop uh, can confirm uh, or, or a validly ordained priest. Then uh, there are reordained deacons and then a priest. So, they're, they're, so in a sense, we're recognizing their ministry in the Episcopal Church, but we're not recognizing their priesthood. So they have to be uh, reordained. Okay. Now, I'm going to get in, into a discussion shortly about why the Catholic Church cannot ordain women. And it's not because of prejudice or misogyny or whatever else. It's, there's some valid uh, reasons for that. But before I get into that, what are the different orders of the ordained ministry? Well, the first one, as I mentioned, is that of the bishop. He shares in the fullness of holy orders and is configured to Christ the high priest. Uh, through ordination, he becomes a member of the College of Bishops. All bishops in union with the Bishop of Rome are a part of the College of Bishops, and of course the Bishop of, the, of Rome is the Pope. Um, now, in terms of the call to become a bishop, it occurs through the Pope. The Pope calls priests to be bishops. But the Pope has different personnel in this country that assist him in selecting bishops for various dioceses. So when Bishop Bowen was called to be a bishop from our diocese and for this diocese, he was called by the Pope to do that, okay? Uh, and there was a, a papal letter read at his ordination as a bishop in the cathedral in Savannah stating that Pope John Paul at that time had called him to be the bishop of the Diocese of Savannah. Okay, so that is the way in which it occurs. The bishop shares in the mission of the total church under the authority of the Pope. So the bishop is not independent of the Pope, but uh, but he's not really, you can't say he's an employee of the Pope. He's, he's his own bishop in his own right within his diocese, but he has to be in union with the Pope. And only a bishop can ordain a deacon or a priest. So I have no authority, let's say, to ordain somebody a deacon in this parish. Uh, only the bishop can do that. And certainly I can't ordain somebody uh, a, a priest. And then bi three bishops are needed to ordain a bishop. Okay, so when Pope Bennett, when, um, Pope Bennett, when Bishop Bowen was ordained a bishop, and I was there for that, uh, the Archbishop of Atlanta was the main ordaining bishop, and then there were two others uh, that assisted him in that. And that's even true, I think, in the Episcopal Church. There has to be three, yeah, in the Orthodox Church as well. Um, bishops share in the office of teaching, sanctifying, and governing the church. The next order is that of priest, and you can also use the term uh, presbyter. Well, how do you spell presbyter? P-R-E-S. P-R-E-S. Okay. Um, and the, 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 the priest is a help, helps the bishop in his ministry of proclaiming the gospel, shepherding the faithful, celebrating the Eucharist and the other sacraments. Priests are co-workers with the bishop and are obedient to the bishop. So when I was ordained, uh, a diocesan priest, and I'll talk about the different kinds of priests in a second, 
I made two promises. I promised celibacy, first of all, lifetime celibacy for the sake of the kingdom. And then I promised, secondly, obedience to my bishop and his successors. Now, obedience in the sense of not blind obedience and, and you know, do with me whatever you want, but obedience in the areas of faith, morals, and church law. Okay, uh, so I don't have to um, promise obedience to the bishop in terms of um, what would be something that I wouldn't have to promise obedience to him. <laughs> yeah, picking up his laundry, you know, uh, and washing it, you know. Now, it probably would be a good move for me to do that, you know. <laughs> but I can say, Bishop, this really is not what I was ordained for. Uh, you know, and then in terms of canon law, certainly he can move me about and I'd have to be obedient to that. Um, or will they always stay at their diocese? They can be moved. Now, ideally, they should stay in their diocese. In fact, Pope Benedict said something about that, but in practice, that's not the case. The bishops that are very good at being bishops, if they're in a small area like our diocese, they're going to get kicked upstairs somewhere else to a larger diocese. And so, for example, the uh, Archbishop of New York, who will eventually be named a cardinal, Archbishop Timothy Dolan, he was the rector of a cathedral, as a, I'm sorry, the rector of a seminary in Rome, uh, and then was named bishop and became an auxiliary bishop, a helper bishop in uh, St. Louis, which was his hometown. But then he was named the Archbishop of Milwaukee shortly after that, and now he's the Archbishop of New York. And it's because of his skills, to be quite honest with you. So the Pope would have named him to New York, which is extremely important in the Catholic Church to have uh, somebody that has New York skills, if you will. And he does uh, in many ways. He's uh, quite a character. Um, I'm also united to the bishop. I'm not in private practice. You know, when you look at a lot of Protestant denominations, especially the... Um, uh, uh, not the traditional ones, but the more non-denominational ones. What we're look, what we're seeing now is that these are becoming family businesses, you know. And somebody is is uh, the the chief executive officer instead of the pastor. And when he dies, their son or daughter is going to take over, or some other family member. Okay. And this really seems to be kind of against what uh, the Bible is, teaches in terms of this. Yes. Yes. Well. We, we had our history like that. We did. That's why we have celibate priests now. <laughs> These other ones have a word for that. <laughs> right. When priests were allowed to marry in the Catholic Church uh, years ago, not the priests, but married priests, uh, married men becoming priests, when the priests died, guess who wanted the property? The family. The family, yes. So one way to deal with that was say, well, we're not going to let priests get married. Uh, but then church law, I think, took care of the property issue later on. But there was a real uh, struggle uh, with the wife and the children of priests wanting to maintain their lifestyle once the priest died or, or whatever. So, so that could have been a, that, that is a problem. The order of deacons assists the bishop and priest. They may baptize, deacon Pat can baptize, he can witness marriages. He can preside at certain aspects of funerals that we have, uh, like the wake the night before or the graveside service, and he can preach a homily during the funeral mass. Uh, deacons are also called to the social ministry of the church, like assisting the poor, uh, setting up soup kitchens, that kind of thing, or working in those kinds of places, depending on what uh, they want to do. Now, in terms of deacons, there are two types of deacons in the Catholic Church today. One that is called permanent, of which um, Deacon Pat is, and the other one is transitional. Now, a transitional deacon is someone who is studying to become a, a priest. So before I was ordained a priest, I was ordained a deacon in November of 1979, and I functioned as a deacon until June 7th of 1980. And it was kind of like an internship. I could do some of the things that a priest could do, but not everything. I can't, couldn't hear confessions. Deacon Pat can't do that. I couldn't celebrate the Mass, but I could preach at it. I couldn't uh, uh, celebrate any of the other sacraments, uh, uh, but I could assist. And I got other experience. I could teach and preach and all that. But my vocation was not to be a deacon. My vocation was to be a priest. Deacon Pat's vocation is to be a deacon. That's why he's called a permanent or vocational uh, deacon in the Catholic Church. Now, in terms of priest, there are two major types. Diocesan, 
also known as secular priests, and religious, who belong to a religious order, priests that belong to a religious order, or a religious institute of some kind. So I was ordained for the Diocese of Savannah by our bishop and committed my life to not only the Bishop of Savannah, but to the Diocese of Savannah. So I will never be moved outside of Savannah unless the bishop kicks me out for some reason. And if he reads my blog, he might. Uh, so, so, it's another story. But anyway, um, so, so I am stuck here in the Diocese of Savannah, which covers the southern half of the state of Georgia, including Columbus, Macon, and Augusta. All three of those cities are on the top end of the diocese and everything south of that. Um, I could have been ordained for a religious order like the Franciscans or the Jesuits, the Dominicans, uh, Glen Marys, there's, there's all kinds of different ones. And my commitment would be to that religious community and their superior, who's not necessarily a bishop. In fact, he wouldn't be a bishop. He'd be a priest that's elected to be the head of that particular order. And they could send me anywhere where they are. So I could be in Macon, Georgia, or I could be uh, in Europe or in Africa or wherever they have communities a priest doing ministry, okay? And usually they have a specialized ministry um, of teaching or of, of parish work or whatever. But I'm still a priest. But a religious priest, in addition to the promise of obedience and celibacy, also takes a, a, a vow of poverty, meaning that they won't own anything personally, but everything that they have is owned by the religious order that they live with or that they're associated with. As a secular priest, I can own property. The car that I have is mine. If my mother leaves me her house when she dies, I can keep that if I can afford it, which I don't think I can. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so, but I could technically. Uh, uh, so I'm allowed to have property in that sense. My salary, though, is such that, that I have to live somewhat simply because uh, well, I don't have a lot of family money, first of all. And then secondly, <laughs> uh, the diocese is certainly not paying me anything. Uh, so I really have been forced into poverty. But anyway, <laughs> so, okay. So does everybody understand that? Then, in terms of bishops, what time is it? In terms of bishops, we have archbishops, which are bishops, they're all bishops, but archbishops are, are head of special dioceses that are very large. Uh, so Atlanta is an archdiocese because of the number of Catholics that are there. And an archdiocese is the head, so to speak, figurative head, of other dioceses associated with them. So in Atlanta, Savannah is joined to the archdiocese or the Metropolitan of Atlanta, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, Savannah. I think those are the, the, the main ones. Yes? Father, a bishop is, uh, can be a secular can be a priest. Yes. Religious. Or a religious, right. A, re a religious priest could be named a, a, a bishop and he would be head of diocesan priest. It's a little bit unusual, but it does happen. The Archbishop of Boston, Massachusetts, who is also a cardinal, Cardinal O'Malley, is a Franciscan. And he still sees himself as a Franciscan. In fact, he will wear his Franciscan robes instead of a cardinal's robe sometimes. Yes. When you go someplace like the monastery of the Holy Spirit up in Conyers, are all those brothers priests? No. Uh, within religious orders, you have both brothers and priests. Uh, they may wear the same garb or, or habit, uh, but there is a distinction within the community. Now, some religious orders are exclusively brothers or monks, uh, and others are exclusively priests or monks, or they're a combination of both. And in Conyers, it's the combination. Uh, and it would be hard to tell by looking at them who is who, but you could at Mass because, uh, from the, the garments that they wear for Mass. Then in terms of archbishops, some bishops and archbishops are called by the Pope to an honorary title of being a cardinal. And uh, the car it's just an honorary title. It's nothing scriptural about it. It helps the, the Pope and the administration of the church. Uh, and they also are chosen to elect uh, the next pope if the pope dies. Some, some priests are called to be monsignors. It's, again, an honorary title to recognize the good that they've done for the church. It's, it's really a, a, just an honor. It has nothing to do with scriptures. It's just kind of an in-house way to honor priests because they don't give us raises. So they call us monsignors. So, <laughs> so yes. You must be a bishop before you can be an archbishop. 
Uh, well, you could be named an archbishop, uh, uh, so a, a priest could be named Archbishop of Atlanta, and he would be ordained bishop, but he, his title would be arch, archbishop. Archbishop and bishop are the same thing. There's nothing different in the degree of ordination. Yeah, okay. Well, he, that's what I mean. He has personnel in this country that assist him, okay. and in this, in the United States, it's the papal nuncio who lives in Washington, and he keeps records of priests that he feels would be good bishops, and then if there's a need for a bishop, he would investigate the list that he has and suggest a name to the pope, and the pope would call that person to be a a, a bishop. How's that list generated? Well, it's, it's interesting. He sends out letters to bishops asking for anybody in his diocese that he thinks could be a bishop. And priests sometimes will get letters from the papal nuncio asking for suggestions. And he'd give a list of criteria. And then sometimes a priest will get letters from the papal nuncio asking to comment on somebody that could be named a bishop. And it's all strictly confidential. I can't even tell you that I got that letter. Uh, and it's, a, it's under what's called a pontifical secret, actually. Yes? Check logs. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 all right. So, lay, lay people can't write letters, though, right? I mean, I don't know, I'm just asking. No, no, lay people normally don't do that. And I'm not sure lay people are sent these letters, to be honest with you. I don't think so, uh, that I'm aware of. I don't know. I don't know. Yes? Oh, an auxiliary, um, thank you. An auxiliary bishop is a bishop. He's fully a bishop, but his authority is in relationship to the head bishop of a diocese. So, uh, like in New York City, even in Atlanta, Archbishop Gregory now has an auxiliary bishop that assists him. So he can do everything that the bishop does uh, in terms of sacraments, and he probably has authority over a particular area of the diocese, Archdiocese of Atlanta, but he's still under Archbishop Gregory. He's not independent, nor is his authority higher uh, or, or even equal to, uh, to Archbishop Gregory. He has to do what Archbishop Gregory asks him so to do. But he is a bishop, pure and simple. He doesn't have to be reordained if he becomes the bishop. Okay? Necessarily be next in line? Not necessarily. But there is another name for those that are next in line called co-adjutor, co-adjutor, or uh, co-adjutor, I think it is. What would you say, co-adjutor or co-adjutor? Yeah, it can go either way. Uh, and so the bishop might name a coadjutor bishop to a diocese, recognizing that the bishop that is there is approaching retirement age. And as soon as he does retire the, and the pope accepts the retirement, the coadjutor bishop becomes uh, the bishop automatically. Okay, so there's no other ceremony that takes place. But while he's the coadjutor bishop, he's still under the authority of the, the, the regular bishop. Yes? A lay person, father, a single, be called by the Pope to be a bishop. Yes, a lay person could be called by the Pope to be a bishop. It's very rare, but it could happen. Uh, technically, in the history of the Church, it has. But more importantly, what has happened in the history of the Church is a layman being named the Pope, and uh, or the Bishop of Rome. And he is then, once he accepts, then he's ordained a deacon, a priest, and a bishop, probably at the same ceremony, and then installed as the head of the Diocese of Rome, which then makes him the pope. Okay? That goes back er to the early centuries of the church. I don't think it's happened in recent times, like recent, like the last 1,800 years. But, uh, <laughs> but in the first two or 300 years of the church, it probably did occur. Yes? Yes. Um, for priest, it, you can ask the bishop to retire at 65, but he, he can say no. He has to allow you to retire at 70, if you wish, and this can change, this is church law, and uh, you must retire at 75. For bishops, the retirement age is 75, but the pope can delay accepting that. So Bishop Bolin is supposed to submit his resignation, not re his retirement in in um, April because he turns 75, but he may not hear from the Pope in terms of accepting that for the next year or so, or two years. So he could be with us, uh, I'd say, two to three more years at the most. Yes? At that time, what would happen to religious priests who own no property? And well, no, they, they would not retire in the sense of, of, they'd still be a member of the order. So the order is responsible for taking care of them. Yeah. So they would stay with them until they die. And most of these religious orders have very good uh, 
uh, homes, if you will, or monasteries and health care and all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but keeping up uh, the monastery and, and is a big <coughs> undertaking. And they it certainly is. And they're getting older, too. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. But there are other ways to take care of that if, if, if that collapsed, let's say. Yeah, or join another larger monastery or something like that. Okay. The ordained ministry uh, has its roots in the Old Testament, as I talked about, uh, that there was a cultic uh, priesthood in the Old Testament to offer sacrifice in the temple. They would sacrifice all kinds of animals, usually lambs or sheep, but also larger animals, uh, goats and oxen and the rest of that. Uh, and this was to appease God. Uh, and to, and then, you know, but there was a cultic worship in the temple. And the priest in the Old Testament was seen as a mediator between God and the people. Uh, not ordained, but born into a priestly family. And they would offer sacrifice on behalf of the people to God. The New Testament views Christ as the eternal high priest who sacrifices himself for our salvation. He is the Lamb of God. We only share in that priesthood. Uh, and so, so on the cross, Jesus brings to a conclusion the sacrificial aspect of the temple, and it's interesting that that does come to a conclusion, and uh, he then establishes himself as both the high priest and the victim, the sacrificial victim, uh, and that experience is what offers God the praise and worship and sacrifice needed for our salvation, but now for an eternity, okay? And um, that eternal sacrifice is perpetuated in the Catholic Mass, of which the priest or the deacon, now acting in the person of Christ to point to the high priesthood of Christ, shows forth Christ continuing to offer himself on our behalf. So when Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice was for everyone in the past, everyone living at the time of the historic crucifixion, and everyone to come in the future, okay? So on this side of eternity, salvation is still being worked out, and Christ is still offering himself. He's not being re-crucified, but he's still offering himself for everyone that he died for on Calvary, past, present, and to come. So the church in every period of time is experiencing the fruit of the sacrifice of the cross at Mass. It's still offered for us. But the work of salvation is complete in heaven. Christ has won the victory. Satan has been conquered. Sin has been conquered. And we are reconciled completely to God in heaven. Okay, But on this side of heaven, eternity is being given birth to, okay? And it is being already experienced in heaven, but not quite yet here on this side. Does that make sense? Okay, we're talking about a philosophical way of looking at the world. Satan has been conquered, but in this life, he doesn't realize it, or I guess, or he's, he's still in the throes of the final battle in terms of eternity but it's already been won. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so in a sense, eternity is already here, but not yet for us. But for those who are in heaven, it is complete. And there's no power of Satan there whatsoever. Eventually, it will be this, true on this side of eternity, when the Lord Jesus returns, and everything is reconciled. It's all rushing about, uh, but there will be a completion to salvation history, <coughs> but it hasn't happened yet. So in, prior to that completion, um, the elements of the battle or the remnants of the battle are still being fought, in a sense, okay? Yes. <coughs> So his deception shall continue just out of pride. Right. Trying to win the battle. Right. Which is lost. Right. It's, it's all a part of the deception. And he's deluded. So that's the... the it's the mm. ultimate insanity to think that the God who created you, you can win. 
Right. Beat, you know, win a war. But what he can do is pull people in his direction. And that's the, the battle that's ongoing now. But not in heaven. That battle is concluded. I mean, you, that does not happen in heaven. And that's where we're moving towards. It is not moving towards the devil. We're moving towards the completion of this and the final victory. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Could you uh, discern a little bit the uh, occult that you referred to a while ago in the form for the, uh, the priest sacrifice of the Old Testament? The cult. I mean, in the sense of... The, the word that you were using? Well, cult means worship, not not a cult in the sense of uh, 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 a negative or the Moonies or, or whatever cults there used to be. Uh, cultic means worship. Uh, uh, that's that's the most important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, the, the cult, uh, the cultic worship, not not cult in the the negative sense. That's a good point uh, there. Now, let me talk about why we cannot ordain women to the Catholic priesthood. Because this is a matter of controversy in the Catholic Church, just as it is a matter of controversy in the Episcopal Church and most Protestant churches. Uh, but in our church, it cannot happen uh, for a number of reasons. And, but in, in other Protestant churches, quite frankly, there's no reason for it not to occur. Okay, And I'll explain that in a second. Um, if I can find my notes on it. Here we go. Okay, From the sociological point of view, there is no reason a woman cannot be ordained a priest. Because I know for a fact that many women could function as a priest and do so much better than I can in terms of ministry, relating to people, maybe even teaching, maybe even preaching, and maybe even how they might celebrate the Mass. They could do it. But that's not the reason that we can't ordain them. But certainly if that was the only reason, uh, then that would be wrong. So from a sociological point of view, there is no reason why a woman can't be ordained a priest. And the reason I say that is that, you know, maybe 50 or 60 years ago, we would not have seen women in roles of leadership in our culture, right? That much. Uh, but that has certainly changed. We have women now running for president, running corporations, uh, doing a good job at being leaders in the secular and governmental realm, okay? And we also see within Protestantism and Judaism, women who are rabbis and ministers and in the Episcopal Church priests. Uh, and for all practical purposes, from what I can tell, they're doing a good job, okay? So from a sociological point of view, there's no reason for it not to be occurring. But from a religious, doctrinal, and sacramental point of view, there are many reasons why it cannot occur in the Roman Catholic Church, in the Eastern Rite of the Catholic Church, and in the Orthodox churches. Okay, and that's what I want to go into. Now, but first we have to understand the Old Testament priesthood. Going back to the early history of Israel, we see that priests were an essential part of God's chosen people. Their function was to act as mediators between the people and God. A priest was, first of all, a mediator. He stood between the people whom he represented and the God whom he addressed. And there are two kinds of mediators in the Old Testament. There were mediators from God to communicate his mind to his, and his will to the people, and these mediators were called prophets. Then, there were, then they were from God to the people. And then there were mediators from the people to God to offer to God on people's behalf adoration, invoke his aid, and beg mercy for the people's sins. And they were called priests. They were to offer sacrifices of goats, sheep, oxen, and cattle, of bread and wine, of wheat, barley, oats, and fruits of trees. The Old Testament priest offered sacrifice. Only those specifically chosen by God were permitted to offer sacrifice, and a priest had to be divinely chosen. Now let's talk about the priesthood of Christianity. And there are three types. The first one is the exclusive priesthood of Jesus Christ. By his incarnation, meaning that he was born of the, or became in, uh, conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Jesus offered his heavenly Father all the acts of his human will. Christ's priesthood began in Mary's womb. He lived his priesthood throughout his life, but especially on the cross, where he united all the acts of mortal human beings capable of suffering and death into one supreme sacrifice, by which he became the mediator between the human race and God, the one mediator. 
Jesus continues as exclusive high priest even now through the sacrifice of the Mass. He is our eternal high priest. Jesus, worship, Jesus worships, praises, and thanks the divine majesty in his own name and in the name of the people that he has redeemed. He intercedes before the throne of the Father for us, and being heard by the Father, he keeps sending down blessings on us from his heavenly home. The priesthood of Jesus Christ is the only one fundamental priesthood now in the Catholic Church. All other priesthoods are participation in this one. Those ordained into the ministerial priesthood, identified as the sacrament of holy orders, are priests, bishops, and deacons. And, priest, uh, and this began, that of bishops and priests, at the Last Supper when the Savior did two things. He changed bread and wine into himself and already offered the night before he died his death that he would endure. And then he told his apostles to do what he did in commemoration of me. So it is a defined article of Catholic faith, a dogma, that the ordained ministerial priesthood, the sacrament of holy orders, was instituted personally by Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. Okay, And who did he ordain? Men, the twelve apostles. Could he have called women to be his apostles? Possibly, but then it would confuse or confound the sacramental ministry that I'm about to go into of what the priest represents. Thirdly, beyond the ordained ministerial priesthood, which is unique and possessed only by those who receive the sacrament of holy orders, there is a true, although subordinate sense, of uh, priesthood of all the faithful, all the baptized. We begin to share in the priesthood of Christ when we are baptized into the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The sacramental character we receive at baptism is deepened by the sacrament of confirmation and nourished by the Holy Eucharist. It is because of this share in Christ's priesthood that we are enabled to offer with the ordained priest at the altar the body and blood of the Son of God to his heavenly Father. Now, let's talk about gender. It is no accident that God became incarnate of the human race as a man or a male, not as a woman. Jesus is the Son of Man, which refers to the people of God collectively, but also to a man who embodies the people of God, a Messiah. So the term Son of Man is a biblical term of the Old Testament that prefigures the Messiah who will represent the people of God to God. And it is son of man, okay, uh, meaning a male person, okay, and that's Jesus, of course. Jesus is both priest and rabbi. He offers himself to God, but he also communicates or teaches as a rabbi or a prophet would. Jesus embodies both his divine, both of these in his divine person, that of priest and rabbi or prophet. Priests in the Old Testament were male. This was in complete contradiction to the false pagan religions that had female priestesses. So keep in mind that in the English language, priest is male, priestess is female. And normally priestess has what connotation even in the, Old uh, even in the English language? Or paganism. Okay, uh, uh, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that's true in the Old Testament as well. Uh, the Catholic ordained priesthood is configured to the exclusive high priest of Jesus and also to his rabbinical function during his public ministry or prophetic function. The church teaches that at the sacrifice of the mass, the ordained priest or bishop acts in the person of Christ. Christ offers himself as the sacrificial lamb who is consumed. And, you know, we break the bread at Mass, which is the body of Christ, and then we consume him. Just as in, in Old Testament sacrifices, after the uh, sacrifice was made and the burnt offering was offered, what do you think they did with it? They ate it. They ate it. it was good stuff. Okay, so, uh, so the same thing occurs uh, in the sacrifice of the Mass, if you will. Okay, but we're receiving our Savior, uh, not that he becomes a part of us, but in order that he would uh, allow us to become a part of him. So the consummation or the destruction of the victim is not a good term, but that's really what occurs. But it, in paradox, it's what helps us to live forever. Um, but anyway, the church teaches that the Catholic priest offers uh, the mass in the person of Christ. Um, 
But it is Jesus himself who is the high priest, okay? And Jesus was a male, correct? Okay. So if you have a woman priest functioning as a Catholic priest would at Mass, and the sacramental nature of the priesthood is, is to show forth a particular aspect of, of who the risen Lord is as high priest, in what way would a, male, would a female priest be able to do that? She can't. I mean, do you see the, the disconnect? Okay, visually, she cannot represent masculinity. Well, maybe she could, but, uh, no, you know, <laughs> but, but visually, she cannot represent masculin masculinity. And the maleness of the risen Lord, who is the high priest. Now, secondly, and this is probably even clearer, Jesus is also the bridegroom of the church. The church collectively is seen as the bride of Christ and the mother of the faithful because through the church new members are born through holy baptism. So in a sense, Christ, the high priest and the bridegroom of the church, begets children through his bride, the church, through holy baptism, not through uh, a physical conception and birth. So the maleness of the priesthood and the femininity of the church collective is essential to traditional Orthodox Catholic belief, okay? So, if the priest, meaning me, or the bishop, is meant to be a visual sign, sacramental sign, of the bridegroomness of Jesus Christ, and the church collectively the bride of Christ, what sign value would a female priest have at the Catholic altar? Can a woman be a groom? <laughs> well, no, but even, even in gay marriage, it's two brides if they're female or two grooms if they're male. Okay? Uh, thus, in the Episcopal Church, which allows ordaining women, they have no problem with two men being married or two women being married because it doesn't matter. We're saying it does matter, okay? <laughs> the maleness of Christ is important. The natural order of marriage is important, man to woman. And we cannot uh, overturn natural law for social convenience or fads that are current in our secular culture. Sometimes they act like that, but no. <laughs> well, um, that's a good question. The church is not as clear on deacons, uh, even officially, about whether or not women can be deacons, because there is a little bit of wiggle room there, even historically speaking, but just a little bit of wiggle room. But in the sense of the, the overall unity of priests, bishops, and deacons, correct, because there's a progression. So, so I don't think that it would occur. But there were deaconesses in the early church, but they really weren't ordained. It was in the early church when we did baptisms, we did immersion of adults. And uh, they were naked. Okay, So the men who were baptized um, were helped out to be dried off by other men or deacons possibly, but the women were dried off by other women assistants, maybe the, the wives of the deacons, who knows. And they would have been called deaconesses if they were the wife, okay? Oh, right, it's, right. It, it is right, it's just set deaconesses. Mm -hmm. But they weren't ordained as such. Very early, in the earliest church, there were clear-cut <laughs> distinctions between their role and men. From the very right. earliest church, clear-cut distinction. Right. Now, one of the things that's happened in the Catholic Church, it's not official, but it has not official, it has not, it will not happen officially, but there has been a move within uh, what we would call radical feminism in the Catholic Church to eliminate all masculine pronouns and feminine pronouns, either referring to God or to the church, okay? So technically, when you refer to the church in the Catholic Church, you would call it, you would call the church Holy Mother Church. You would refer to a church as she. 
um, and, uh, and the mother of all the faithful. But radical feminists don't like that because, and they don't like masculine terms for God like him uh, and what would be some other masculine terms, that, or his, or, or father. Uh, in fact, some radical feminists even refuse to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They say uh, Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, uh, which is a modifier of what God does, but it's not who God is. Uh, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, he might be Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, but that's something he does. It's not necessarily who he is. Uh, so, so there's a her heresy being promoted when you only refer to God as uh, by what he does rather than who he is. It's like, um, um, what would be the case of that in, in, in human interaction? That you appreciate somebody not for who they are, but for what they do. Like, oh, you're a millionaire. I really love you. Uh, you know, rather than you as a person. You know, uh, so it's a very materialistic way of, 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 of viewing God. In fact, in the Catholic Church, there were some priests who were baptizing infants saying, I baptize you in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. And I think it was the Cardinal Archbishop of, of Boston when he got wind of this, because it occurred in Boston, uh, who ordered every one of those priests to go through the records, find out who it was that they baptized using that formula, and told them that those children were not baptized, and that they had to re-baptize the children using the correct formula. Okay. It, it, it did happen in Australia. Yeah, and it happened in Boston, too, as I recall. And it probably has happened elsewhere, but the bishops don't know about it. But it's an invalid baptism. So if you neuter the church as she, and you neuter God as he, and then you can refer to both of them as it, then it doesn't matter about the spousal relationship, does it? And that gets the camel's nose into the tent of ordaining women as priests. Okay? And that's probably what happened in the Episcopal Church, to a certain extent. But the Episcopal Church does not have the same high sacramental understanding of the priest as high priest bridegroom and good shepherd. In fact, they may not even have that period. I don't know. Would you say, where's Buck at? What would you say, Buck? They, they tend to be... Um, even in, in their traditional theology. They, they tend to be very ambivalent about it at best. So technically, their theology and doctrine could open the door to a female priesthood. Uh, yes, I, I think so. Yes. Uh, and also, it, it, if I could just add that, that this whole gender neutral thing really de emphasizes both personhood and the importance of carnality or the theology of the body. Right. Because everyone we know is a he or a she. So if you see, you know, I, I want to see a radical Catholic priest to talk about God came to earth to reveal to us uh, God's truth about the nature of God's self, just taking out. Yeah, you, you turn God into a thing, and how can we relate to that? Right. Uh, so it, it downplays the whole notion of human carnality and, and personality. Father, when my husband Mark was going to Yale Divinity School to become an Episcopal priest, you weren't even, this was back in the late 80s and the 90s, you were not allowed to say Father or He. For God. Right. Correct. If you were in class speaking, you Correct. were not allowed to right. say that. And that, unfortunately, was true in some of our Catholic seminaries, especially in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and, uh, well, you would avoid all these uh, male references, so you would say God. And it would only be God. God's house. And God, uh, him, God's self. God, you would never say himself or his. It's always God's. Uh, uh, but God is a male term, you know, which is odd too. You know, they don't say goddess, although some may be using that term. I don't know. Change the language. It's funny how I, can, I can't do this liturgically. I pull out of context, but you'll you'll hear people and you will come tell they've got a huge chip on their shoulder. Uh, somebody help me through this. I can only remember the first line since I'm not a master. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands. Uh, uh, oh, that's right. Uh, praise and glory of God's name. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, what is your uh, pray, brothers and sisters, that that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. May the Lord receive the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of His name, for, of His name, for the well-being of God's church. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right.
Right. You can tell it's money there. It's just yeah. got an attitude. And it, you know, mm -hmm. part of this is the, the old heresy in terms of a dualism, in terms of the physical doesn't really matter, matter right. rather than the idea that we are spiritual and physical beings, and what we are right. physically is important. Now, it is also important to say that when we speak of God the Father, that we're speaking of a pure spirit here. We can't say that God is necessarily male, uh, that, but that he would, con, con, would uh, embody... Uh, the totality of creation, in a sense, you know. yeah. So, we're, so it's not that we're saying that God is a man, but we can say that Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, is a man. Uh, uh, so, but Jesus calling the Father, Father. right? Jesus called God Father, and he also called, called God Abba, which is Daddy. So, so you can't get away from it. But those who want to retranslate the scriptures want to use gender-neutral terms even for those references. So how is the church handling this? Well, it's, it's, it, it, officially the church is not allowing it, but you still have people that are pushing it. So it's, 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 uh, uh, it's not official by any means. They think they can affect change from the bottom up. This ain't going to happen. In fact, they're failing. They're, they're falling apart, just like the Episcopal Church is falling apart. I mean, the same thing's happened to a Catholic feminist that's happening to the Episcopal Church. Pope Benedict, I mm -hmm. think he, he says it well, and he said, you know, I mean, obviously God incorporates femaleness, but... The, the, those are not titles. His titles are Father. His Correct. title is Son. But you can also say that that uh, Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ is the church, correct? Yes. He is the head, but together there's feminine and masculine characteristics there. So, so that's important to know. Yeah. So, but it can, uh, so, I, so does everybody understand why Catholics and Orthodox cannot ordain women? It's not a prejudice or behind the times or, or we're against social innovation. It has something to do, everything to do with the sacramental character of the sacrament of holy orders as it relates to Christ the high priest and bridegroom of the church. This theology that I've just enunciated is not true for Baptists. They don't have the sacrament of holy orders or Methodists. They don't believe in the sacrament of holy orders. Lutherans don't either. Uh, Episcopalians do to a certain extent. Uh, but the churches of the Protestant Reformation did away with all the sacraments except two, baptism and Eucharist, okay? But in our sacramental theology, the Eucharist is related to the priesthood, correct? Because Jesus instituted that on, at the Last Supper. So we would say that what traditional Protestantism of the Protestant Reformation did was to uh, diminish the nature of the Eucharist, or Holy Communion, by eliminating the sacrament of holy orders. But because they did that, it doesn't matter who presides over their celebration of the Lord's Supper, they don't have a sacramental understanding of that. So it doesn't matter. Okay? But if you're a Catholic, it does, or an Orthodox Christian. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, yeah, Pope uh, John Paul said it. He said, you know, because people were raising the issue, and he said, you know what? This has been the constant teaching of the church, and I can't go against what Jesus did and said. You know, well, that's a good point there, uh, and we'll talk about this later on in terms of papal infallibility. Catholics are saying, well, he's the pope, he can change that. And the pope has come out and said, I have no authority to change that. Exactly. He can't do whatever he wants to willy-nilly. He has to be faithful to the tradition of the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. A couple more. Okay, one more, and then, then you have the questions because we're going late. What, what was the... Okay. Yes. Um, as far as uh, everybody having to be celibate, could someone, you know, get married in their young life and then maybe get widowed to make them become a yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, that happens all the time. Yes. We have a priest, uh, Father Markham. Twice. Twice widowed, yeah, yeah. And he's a doctor, a medical doctor. Yeah, but we don't hold that against him. Um, but. <laughs>